Hello, everyone. This is the 36 District Democrats, and we are happy this evening to be interviewing Luca for Seattle City Council District 5. And we are about to hand the baton over to you, Luca, to introduce yourself. So welcome and thank you. Yes, um, I suppose uh, I should just start with my name. I'm Luca Murdoch Howard, and um, I decided to run for the uh, District 5 council seat because uh, I was actually uh, actually wanted to volunteer for the longest time with uh, Miss Deborah Juarez's re-election campaign before I learned that she, in fact, was not running. But I couldn't find that out since uh, I couldn't. She had an office at North Seattle, but um, nobody knew the hours. Nobody knew where it was, and it sort of it sort of inspired me to try and be a maybe a bit more of a accountable council member than Miss um, Juarez, uh, and uh, also, of course. I think because of a sort of result of this uh, lack of hearing the community, uh, there's been a lot of uh, problems that haven't been addressed or been put off by a uh, council that is mainly homeowners uh, and is sort of is not is less concerned with the plight of, you know, students who can't move out of their parents' houses, who uh, need to move out with three, four people and still can hardly afford rent. It's um, and maybe I can sort of address those problems in a more <laughs> comprehensive way than the uh, than the current council. Thank you so much, Luca. The first question this evening is going to be asked by Jasmine. Over to you, Jasmine. Jasmine. Yeah. Um, our first question is, what steps will you take to ensure that the city remains safe for all, including Black, Indigenous, and LGBTQ people while keeping police accountable to elected leadership and community? It sounds like it's two questions in one, which is that, A, how are you going to keep, um, uh, you know, LGBTQ people um, and uh, uh, black and brown people safe? And then also how are you gonna keep the police accountable? And of course, the way that a city council member, I think can uh, keep uh, black and brown people and LGBTQ uh, people safe is going to be by, um, uh, interacting with a lot of the uh, LGBTQ led uh, groups and as well as uh, sort of uh, taking cues from them in decision making. Um, and of course, the way that you can keep police accountable is by making sure that the accountability process is functioning, which at the moment it is, if it is functioning, then it is not functioning um, in, it's, it's not functioning particularly well. And so I think that there should be uh, reforms made there, uh, especially along the lines of the uh, Stop Seattle group. Thank you so much, Luca. The next question this evening will be asked by Toby. Toby, Sweet. over to you. How would you ensure the city has an updated climate action plan and what specific actions would you prioritize to get us back on track to meet Seattle's Green New Deal goals? Well, the way that I see it is that uh, carbon emissions in Seattle come from two places, and that is gas lines and cars. Uh, we largely, at least the people that get their energy from Seattle City Light, which is you know, the city, um, we get ours from hydro, so that's uh, clean. Of course, I'm not going to talk about the environmental repercussions of hydropower, but the main two are those. And so the way that you fix uh, gas lines is by trying to install more electric stoves. And so you can, uh, by continuing to offer rebates uh, and maybe increasing rebates for those as well as uh, electric heating units um, and removing as many gas lines as possible. And the second way is to just limit the use of cars. Um, of course, I'm sitting here in uh, Licton Springs, which has um, exactly one bus line that gets you downtown, uh, maybe, uh, we can invest in a little bit more efficient public transit that comes reliably. And if it comes reliably and it comes frequently, then people use it and get out of their cars, which are of course um, killing the environment a little bit. <laughs> Thank you. Our next question this evening is going to be asked by Sherry. Hi, and uh, second, I'm having, oh no, it worked. Okay, over to you, Sherry. Okay. Uh, the Move Seattle levy is set to expire at the end of 2024. The next nine-year transportation levy will go before the voters in November 2024 to begin in 2025. What investments and improvements would you prioritize for the next transportation levy? 
Well, I, I know that um, the, the Move Seattle levy, uh, it can do a couple of things in North Seattle. Um, I, and of course, since I'm up here in District 5, uh, I, I'd be focusing on those. But uh, specifically, lots of uh, straight and protected bike lanes so that you can actually get east, west, north, south in the city. Um, two is uh, bus lanes for the 40 because uh, it's one of the only ways or one of the only uh, fast and efficient ways that you can get to Ballard uh, from North Seattle. Uh, and it is extraordinarily uh, sort of unsuccessful in being uh, frequent and reliable. Uh, and also, um, I would prioritize the improvements that are being made around the 145th and 130th Street stations, uh, especially in Pinehurst. Uh, because uh, around Ingram, which uh, I've I've been trying to, I, I've been learning about the improvements there and how uh, funding is a little bit dubious. And I want to make sure that uh, people can actually get to the 130th station if they're not driving, because of course, there's not going to be a parking lot. Thank you so much. The last prepared question before we move into follow-ups this evening will be asked by Shep. The city has been in a homelessness state of emergency since 2015, yet our homelessness crisis has not receded. What are we doing wrong and what steps will you take to address the crisis? Well, I can tell you what we're not uh, what we're doing wrong, which is that we are building all uh, we are building not enough housing and we are building too much market rate housing because uh, I'm again I'm in Licton Springs right now, and I can see a lot of uh, housing developments that have opened within the last just couple of years. Um, and those houses are not in any sense of the word affordable. Um, of course, turning housing, uh, turning like single family houses into more dense housing is amazing. And it, but it's a long term goal. It's like, how long is it going to take for the market to, you know, build enough houses to the point where it can be affordable for people that are you know lower middle class nurses teachers etc instead we have the solution right now of being able to invest in the seattle social housing developer that assures the, that one of the sort of founding tenants of it is that uh, nobody's going to pay more than 30 percent of their income for housing and it's going to be proportional and yeah fund that build as much as possible and um, maybe we'll actually start to see some uh, housing solutions and uh, see a uh, stop to the crisis. Thank you so much, Luca. The next part is the board members will raise their hand and ask some follow-up questions. Those will have, you've been answering your questions in about a minute, so about the same length, but maybe a little bit shorter than you had before. And the first question is from Toby, over to you. So following up on your last question, uh, I happen to have a question that uh, I've been asking of uh, every city council candidate. Mm -hmm. Inclusionary housing is explicitly allowed by the recently passed state level missing middle zoning bill to help ensure production of more low income housing in every community. How would you support using inclusionary housing in Seattle? Well, I, if I'm not mistaken, it's everywhere except for in HOA zones, and it's it's not it's it's a too little too late um, to just like magically fix the housing crisis. I 100% support it. It I don't think it went far enough. Um, I think the distance where uh, the distance to transit, which it uh, says that you can upzone more is not far it's not far enough and yeah we need to make sure a uh, gun for a more extensive uh, comp plan and we need to build social housing in those areas because that's the way that you're actually going to knock this crisis out thank you so much let me see if there is a next follow-up question from shep over to you yeah um i saw on your website that you are in favor of the vacancy tax uh, can you tell me about that? Uh, what you would tax and how that would work? Um, well, obviously, um, in District 5, uh, you can go about, uh, uh, I think it's like a mile-ish south of Lake City, and you can see all of these massive vacant auto lots that I'm sure haven't been um, used in years. Uh, and one of the theories that I've heard as to why there's so many vacant properties uh, in Seattle, one of the hottest real estate markets in the country, 
is that they're just holding on it, holding on to it, waiting for it to increase in value. So hopefully what a vacancy tax is going to do is it's going to make it so that uh, people start selling and that that land starts getting developed. And of course, uh, I'd be in favor of the vacancy tax uh, only if those proceeds go to building houses, because uh, obviously the reason why you want the vacancy tax is you get it. Oh, I still have however many seconds. Yeah, yeah. You can, yeah, you can finish your thought. Yeah, you, the reason that you have the vacancy tax is to encourage housing. Let's actually use the proceeds to build housing. Thank you. Are there more follow-up questions from the board? Uh, Laura Marie. Hi, Luca. Um, I love, yeah. oh, sorry, my coughing child walked in at the same time. Uh, <laughs> I love to ask the candidates, uh, what is really exciting to you about this position? And what is something you have discovered that you think most voters might not know about? Oh, I love that question. Okay. The, the thing that I find really exciting about the District 5 position is the, we have the opportunity right now to shape the, the way that North Seattle is going to look for generations to come with the Aurora, Redevel uh, Aurora Redevelopment Project. Um, that's going full steam ahead. Uh, well, actually, it's not anymore. The funding has been restrained to 2029, but maybe we can get some funding from the city for that. I don't know. Um, and with all of the new comp plan stuff that's going to be expanding urban home zones in, uh, along Aurora, this is a very exciting time to be uh, a sort of representative for North Seattle. And furthermore, uh, what was the second part of that question again? Something that maybe voters don't know about the city council role. I went into uh, canvassing, not realizing the dire straits that seniors are in. I've gone to like countless houses with, you know, Norwegian flags with, uh, you know, people who've been living here forever, their dads were fishermen. And they're saying, oh, I'm selling my house. I don't make enough to live here anymore. And I, I sort of went into it thinking, oh, well, I'm going to campaign for, you know, social housing, better housing costs for, you know, people that are young. But actually, it's people that are both young and people that are old, and even like, you know, as, as I said, nurses and teachers who are having to move to, uh, you know, have two, three hour commutes. It's social housing is needed for everybody. And um, yeah, if we can get housing costs down, that would be a massive win. Great. So Luca, I was going to ask you to keep that question going. So I gave you the gave you extra time. The next question is from Jeremy. Over to you. Hi. Um. So, um, you had you had mentioned that uh you, that you went in thinking you know sort of looking at like what you were going to do for younger residents, and you just sort of based on a quick look at your website, it looks like you're a uh, recent high school graduate and are probably mm -hmm. the youngest candidate we are interviewing for any position. So what um, what what do we need what um do we and um, and I mean I guess really our government in particular need to be doing better to reach out to our younger residents to really make sure their voices are being heard. Do something. Um not to be offensive to y'all Democratic Party people, but you guys haven't, you, you guys have sort of dropped the ball. Um, you're, there's, I, I know that uh, there's been a few, you haven't gotten uh, Medicare for all. You haven't gotten housing affordability. You haven't gotten the tax code done. So if you could start supporting, consistently supporting policies when you have a super majority in the dang Congress, then I think that young people would certainly be a lot more enthusiastic. Great feedback. Thank you, Luca. Are there more follow up questions from our e board at this point in time? I think we have run out of questions. We appreciate the very thoughtful answers that you have provided. Jeremy is going to give a brief recap over what will happen next. We will also send this. Um, summary to you by email, but over to you, Jeremy, um, and we can stop the formal part of our interview tonight with you. And just over to you, Jeremy, to 